Thank you, thank you. It's so good to be with you guys at Southwest today. I'm super, super excited to be here with you. I've loved this church for decades. Uh, my wife and I, we started our church in our home with six of our friends uh, almost 30 years ago, and we've just seen God do amazing, amazing things. And I want the world to come to church because Jesus gave us the church, and the church shares the manifold wisdom of God. But let me just be, be honest this morning. Our vision at Sandals is being real. How many of you have a family member or a friend that doesn't believe in God? Raise your hands. Look around. And no matter how good of a preacher Ricky is, no matter what the series is, they're, they're not coming to church. Does anybody have that friend? For some of you, it's somebody that you love, somebody that you care for, someone that matters to you. How are we gonna wake the world up to the miraculous power of the Jesus that we know, love, and serve? One of my dearest friends uh, does not believe in God. He would not come to Sandals. He's not gonna read this book. Uh, he's not, he's not going to come to church no matter how clever the sermon series is, but you know what? He got COVID and he was one of the individuals who got COVID and went into the ICU and, and, and he was literally hours away from being put in a coma by the hospital. And you know, he had his nurse FaceTime me. He had his nurse FaceTime me and the nurse held up the phone so that I could pray over him. And I said, let me understand this, John. You want me to pray to a God you don't think exists. And you want me to ask that God that you're not sure that exists. You want me to ask that God for a miracle. Do I understand? And he had the big ventilator up his nose and tears came down his eyes because he has five children. He's married. He has grandchildren. He has a life ahead of him. And he just nodded. Yes, I want you to pray to this God that I'm not so sure. You know, he went home two days later completely healed. Amen. Amen. That's what, that's what miracles do. And he's in the opening chapter of this book. And so I want you to know, I'm not here to sell books, although I'd love you to buy one. Uh, I want you to know this. All the proceeds from this book go to send kids at camp at Sandals Church because I met Jesus as a 15-year-old at summer camp. And I want young people in our world today to get away from the world and get alone with Jesus at camp. And so if you buy this book today, just know that's where the money goes because I want to see the world changed for Jesus, and I wanna encourage you guys to trust. Now, how many of you guys have ever in your life seen a miracle? Raise your hands. I was amazed at your church after last service. I had a guy come up to me and said, I died twice. I'm like, wow, I hadn't even died once yet. You know, tell me your story. And you know what I told him? I was like, you need to write a book. He's like, people keep saying that. I'm like, yeah, you die twice, you know. You know, you could call it die twice, twice is nice. I don't know what the book title is, but, but you gotta write that. But some of us in here, We've never experienced a miracle. Some of us in here, we've asked God for a miracle and it didn't happen. And so whenever somebody starts talking about miracles, you get a little leery. You're like, okay, what are you selling? What's going on? What's the angle? Some of us grew up in abusive churches that were name it and claim it, and you were told that your loved one died because you didn't have faith. I want you to know that's not true. We don't give God orders, we take orders. This is not a name it and claim it book. I want you to know that God, when you pray, can say yes to your miracle today because he's good, but I want you to know today, God can say no to your miracle because he's God. And Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the night before he was crucified, you know he asked God for a miracle and do you know that God said no? And Jesus said, not my will be done, but yours. Every single prayer that you've ever prayed has been answered yes, no, or wait. I hate the wait, amen? I, I get irritated at Starbucks and they're so fast. <laughs> but the Lord wants to bless you today. So let me just pray over you. We're gonna end in prayer where you're gonna have an opportunity to stand and ask God for healing, for a miracle, whatever it is. And so I just wanna begin with prayer by asking God to move in our hearts today, to open our hearts up just ever so slightly like my friend John, who needed a miracle. If you need a miracle today, I want you to ask God and say, Lord, would you just move in my family, my marriage, my finances? Would you move in the heart of my kid? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just ask in the name of Jesus that you would move here today at Southwest Church. For somebody watching online today, I pray that you would move in their hearts from wherever they are, that God, that you would jump off the screen and into their life. God, move in our hearts in miraculous ways. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna start today with the first miracle Jesus ever performs. The first miracle that he ever does. And I think a lot of times as Christians, we know this miracle, but we don't ever ask, 
Why is this the first thing Jesus ever did? Because up until this moment, he's just a normal guy. He's just a fellow villager. He's just the son of Joseph and Mary. He's just a friend. Until this moment, no one knows what he can do. In John chapter two, verses one through 11, the next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to this celebration. And listen to this, if you're Baptist, listen to this. The wine ran out. It was like Coachella, amen? People were drinking too much. The wine ran out. And look what happens. Jesus' mother comes to him and she says, they got no more wine. Apparently there were some drinkers present. Listen to what Jesus says, dear woman. Now, if you have a mom, don't ever call your mom woman. But if you're the Lord, you can call her whatever you want, amen? That's what I'm saying. You wanna go meet Jesus, call your mom woman. That's all I'm saying. They have no more wine. Dear woman, listen to what he says. That is not our problem. What I love about this miracle is Jesus doesn't even want to do it. But he does. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for a Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. Fill them with water. And when the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. How many of you have ever thrown a party in your life? Raise your hand. Birthday party? Raise your hand. Not very many partiers in Palm Springs, apparently. <laughs> Can you imagine hiring a critic? Hiring a critic to judge your food, to judge your decorations, to judge your wine. That's what Jewish people do, okay, or did. They hired somebody to critique the festivities, and this person's job was to let your family and friends know you're not cheap, amen? This was his job. And so they say, take this wine, because they knew where it came from. They knew that it came from water. Take this wine to the master of the ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions, and when the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over and he says, the host always serves the best wine first. Now, why is that? You get your friends drunk on Guinness and then you serve Pap's Blue Ribbon, amen? That's what you do. And all the, all the people who drink just laugh. So now you know who they are. Everybody that didn't get that joke, you're like, okay, I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. He says, no, no, no. What most people do is they serve the best first, and then after people are drunk, you serve the bad wine. But listen to what he says. He says, but you have kept the best till now. Some of you, you've been a Christian your whole life. What if God has kept the best until now? This is your moment, this is your day. This is the moment where your life changes, where God transforms your life. This miraculous sign in Cana of Galilee was the first Jesus did, listen to these words, to reveal his glory. And all his disciples believed in him. I believe we need a movement of miracles in this country, and here's why. You know why in California, your neighbors, your family, your friends, you know why they're not going to church? They're not worried about heaven and they're not worried about hell. They're worried about their life. What does the Lord Jesus do when he first arrives? He does miracles. Almost 40 miracles the Lord Jesus does. 28 of them are healing miracles. This one is a miracle turning water into wine. Why does Jesus do miracles? Because miracles draw attention to God. Listen to me, miracles don't give us answers. They force people to ask big questions. If you have a loved one, a family member that doesn't believe in God, sick Jesus on them. I had a guy in my church tell me after service one day, he said, I'm an atheist. Help me believe. I said, well, let's pray. I said, what do you got to fear? God's not real, right? And he was all weirded out. I said, why are you intimidated? I'm going to pray something that doesn't exist over you. I knew what was happening. I was sick and Jesus on him. You don't know what can happen when you bring Jesus into somebody's life. We had a woman in our church. I didn't tell this story in the first service. You get this for free. She had a bunch of young men break into her house. They didn't know she was there. They woke her up. She's an old lady, an elder lady with a cane. How did she get him out? She started shouting, Jesus, Jesus. And those boys ran out. 
And you wanna know how I know that story's real? Because one of those young men came to our church the next Sunday. Can you imagine breaking into somebody's house and they start screaming Jesus at you? He gave his life to Christ. He's like, I'm done with that, man. That woman prayed Jesus over me. I want you to know today that you can't get a miracle because of me. You can't get a miracle because you go to a faith-based healer, because someone writes a book on healing. You can get a miracle because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, he is the miracle worker. Because of Jesus, I can ask for anything I need. What do you need today? Dear woman, that's not our problem. Jesus doesn't even want to answer this prayer. Can you imagine today you pray in the Lord Jesus in heaven? He's like, really? Really? Anybody ever pray for something silly? Remember the Garth Brooks song, I thank God for unanswered prayer? Oh my gosh. The Lord has something for you today. The Lord has a miracle for you today. You can pray and ask God for anything you need. What does Mary know about her son that you don't or you've forgotten? Jesus is not interested in this prayer. Jesus is not interested in this party. He's not interested in this problem. What does Mary know that you and I have forgotten? Mary knows that her son loves her. Have you forgotten today how much God loves you? Ephesians 5, 2, live a life filled with love. Following the example of Christ, he loved us and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. But you say, well, Pastor Matt, I'm not, I'm not the mom of Jesus. I'm not a pastor. I want you to look at this next verse. I, I love this verse. 1 Peter 1, 7. And remember, why does it say to remember? Because we forget this that your heavenly father to whom you pray has what? No favorites. He doesn't care more about me than he cares about you. He cares about all his children. He loves all of his children. Some of you today, you feel worthless. Let me tell you something. God thought you were worth Christ. That's how much you're worth. What is it that you need to bring to God today? I grew up a, a, a Baptist uh, kid. My dad was a Baptist minister and every Friday, every other Friday night, my dad would take me out on a date. Now, we had a limit. We could only spend five bucks. But every other Friday, I had a brother, so he got one Friday, then I got the next Friday. Every other Friday night, my dad took my brother and I out on a date, and we could do anything we want. We could go anywhere we want as long as it cost five bucks. But, you know, in 1985, I, I wanted to be a professional skateboarder. I knew that's what the Lord called me to do, and uh, I want you to know you could not pay me to get on a skateboard because I'm 50. You think pickleball will kill a 50-year-old? Let me tell you, a skateboard will kill a 50-year-old. But when I... When I was a teenager, I, I just knew I wanted to be a professional skateboarder. But then in Sacramento, California, we had a celebrity amongst us. He's the most famous person in Northern California for a period of time. His name was Greg LeMond, and he was the first American to ever win the Tour de France. And so I changed. I, I, I no longer was called to be a skateboarder. I was called to win the Tour de France for the glory of God. Amen? <laughs> Anybody else called to be famous for Jesus? And so on my Friday night, I took my dad to the local bike store and I showed him this bike. And I said, Dad, this is a Nishiki International. Now they don't call themselves Nishiki anymore, they call themselves Giant, they changed their name. I said, Dad, this is a Nishiki International, it's the nicest bike that Nishiki made, it was about $1,000, and my dad was so excited, and I told him about the amazing gear shifting that the Japanese had invented, I told him about the aluminum frame, I told him, I said, Dad, if you just buy me this bike, I'll be famous one day. My dad was super excited. He was like, oh my gosh, this is so incredible. And then he looked at the price tag. <laughs> it's the only time in my childhood I remember my dad crying. My dad stood back. He was overwhelmed with emotion and disappointment because his son had a dream. And here's what he told me. He said, son, we don't have that kind of money. And I felt so guilty I felt so bad. I swore to God, I know you're not supposed to swear to God, I swore to God, I would never ask for that bike again until the next morning. <laughs> Anybody got a kid like that? I'll never do it again, mom, I'll never do it again. I was that kid. 
the next morning I was playing Little League. I was 14 years old and I was riding the bench because that's where my talent took me. And a young man came up on this bike, the exact color, the exact model, the exact bike that I had shown my dad the evening before that my dad said we could not possibly afford. He said, hey kid, you wanna buy a bike? I said, how much is the bike? He said, 75 bucks. I said, is it stolen? He said, no, it's not stolen. He said, he said I, I, I'm, I'm in the Air Force and tomorrow I'm getting shipped out to Guam and I can't take the bike with me. Do you want it? I ran out of the dugout, past my coach, straight to my parents who were not paying attention because I wasn't playing. I said, dad, 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 remember the bike, remember the bike. My dad said, yeah. I said, it's for sale, this kid's gonna sell it to us. My dad came over, he said, how much you want? 75 bucks, my dad said, is it stolen? He told him the same story, here's what my dad said. I did a wedding on Thursday and I got paid $75 extra. So my dad went and asked my mom. She said, yeah, I could have it as long as we took it to the police station to make sure it wasn't stolen. You see, my dad and I knew it was a miracle. My mom had doubts. We went to the police station. There's a serial number on the bottom of the bike. They used to do that in the 80s. There's no record of it being stolen anywhere. Then we took it to the Nishiki International store and there's no record anywhere on paper at any store in America or any factory in Japan of this bike ever being made. It does not exist, but it does. You know what I believe? The Lord Jesus saw a 14 year old boy and he knew one day he would have to proclaim faith in front of thousands. And so he answered that stupid little prayer to teach him that God hears, that God heals and God does miracles. Amen. And if you, if you ever come to my office, this hangs above my head. And you know, I told my wife I wanna be buried with this thing because it reminds me that God hears my prayers, God cares about my heart, and that I matter to Jesus. Some of you have forgotten that today. It's what Mary knows. He doesn't wanna turn water into wine. Why are you bothering me? I didn't wanna be at this wedding. Anybody raise a young son? Like, I'm only here because of you, Mom. But what does Mary know that we forgot? He loves her. What does Mary say that you forgot? Do whatever he says. How different would your life be today if you just lived out those two things? What does Mary know that I forgot? What does Mary do that I don't? You see, there are no such thing as silly prayers. Philippians 4.19, and the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now you may think Palm Springs has money, your father in heaven has more. He has more. And he cares about you. My daughter's here today somewhere, my oldest daughter. We celebrated Mother's Day yesterday here at Palm, in Palm Springs because we weren't able to celebrate last week. And when she was a little girl, every night I would say prayers with her. And you know what she would say every night? Lord Jesus, give me good dreams or no dreams at all. Man, and you know, because she wanted to know that there wasn't a monster in the closet, amen? And I knew if she didn't get sleep, we didn't get sleep, we'd have a monster the next day in the house. So I wanted the Lord to answer that prayer. Please, Jesus, let us have sleep. But she prayed that every night. And you know what? The Lord heard her every night because he cares for her. And she wasn't just my little girl, but she's his little girl forever. And I want you to remember that, and I want you to not forget that. Next, I can ask for a miracle no matter where I am. Some of you are like, well, Pastor Matt, I'm not, I'm not right with God today. I'm not right with God. I, I, I haven't been living right, I've not been thinking right, I haven't been to church in forever. Look, the first, Miracle doesn't take place in church. It's not in the synagogue. It's at Coachella. People are drunk. And God still moves. God still moves. Matthew 7, 8 through 11. Jesus says this, for everyone who asks, receives. There's no such thing as an unanswered prayer. One of the reasons I believe this book is so important is we, I hear people say this all the time. I asked God for that and, I, and he didn't answer it. No, he answered it. It just wasn't the answer you wanted. Every prayer you've ever prayed is answered yes, no, 
or wait? Jesus says, ask. Why should you ask? Because God is good. God is good. In chapter six, we had a woman in our church, Natasha. She's had cancer since she was 18 years old. 18 years old. She battled cancer until she was almost 30. And the city of hope said, there's no more hope. You have three weeks to live. She came into my office and she asked for prayer. Jesus, Jesus, she screamed, I don't want to die. And you know what? The Lord answered her prayer that day and she still works for me six years later. And you know why that is? It's not your time until the Lord calls you home. Where do you go when the city of hope says there's no hope? You go to Jesus. Where do you go when you need a miracle? You go to Jesus. When Tammy and I, we went to Israel for the first time, I couldn't believe. When we, go, when we go to the first church in Bethlehem where they celebrate the birth of Jesus, it's full of Muslim women who want to get pregnant. Isn't it interesting? Muslim women go to the church where Jesus was born. Why do they go there? Because even in the book of Islam, uh, the Quran, do you know who is the, is, is the one who does miracles? It's Jesus. Isn't it sad that Muslims know more about Jesus than many of you as Christians do? You forgot where to go. And if you need a miracle today, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? Why won't you pray? Why won't you ask? Jesus says, ask. Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Everyone who, everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Raise your hand if you're a parent today, raise your hand. Listen to this, he's talking to you. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, would you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts, listen, to those who ask? I've been studying the Bible for 30 years, and let me tell you something. It says this clearly, you do not have, because you do not ask. What if on the day of judgment when we stand before God, when we stand before Jesus, we have to walk through a warehouse full of all our prayers that we, the answers to our prayers that we never asked. They were waiting for us. They were right there, and you never asked. I'm not guaranteeing a yes, but I guarantee this. If you don't ask, God won't say yes. God is not in the business of answering prayers that are not prayed. You could change your life today with a prayer. You could change somebody else's life today with a prayer. I do not promise you the miracle you want, but Jesus will always give you the miracle you need. I got a friend of mine, he's a Dallas Theological graduate, and if you don't know what that is, it's kind of the super smart Christians go to school there. That's not where I went to school. I tell my kids, C stands for Christian. That's the kind of grades I got, amen? You know, it's because I'm like Christ. But he read my book, and he said when he got to when God says no, he said, you quoted a verse. He said, I didn't think that was in the Bible. I said, you think I would put a verse in my book that's not in the Bible? He said, yeah. He went and double-checked. He fact-checked me. He fact-checked me. He thought I was fake news, right? That's what he thought. And you know what he said? He said, you were right. That verse has always been in there. I said, I know. And do you know what verse I was talking about? When the Lord Jesus asked to not die on the cross for your sins, and he sweat drops of blood, God said no. The very next verse, it says, and angels were sent from heaven to minister to him. When God gives you a no to your miracle, he will give you a yes to strength. And he will minister to you. And so what that means is, yeah, we can clap for that. Amen. What that means, you can pray. You can pray that your divorce, does, your marriage does not end in divorce. And if it does, it doesn't mean that God didn't answer your prayer. It means he's going to give you a different answer. He's going to give you strength to get through your divorce. You can pray, you can pray, and you can cry out that a loved one doesn't die. And if God says no to that miracle for healing, he can say yes to you for strength. It may not be the miracle you want, but it is always the miracle you need. And I gotta be honest with you. 
I don't learn from success. I have learned through suffering. And that's just the reality. God loves you. God can say yes to your prayer for a miracle because he's good. And God can say no because he's God. And that's hard for us. But for many of you, it may just be a wait. It may just be a wait. Because of Jesus, I can pray, I can ask for a miracle for anyone. It doesn't have to be for you. It can be for someone you love, someone you care for, someone that matters. I can't tell you how many times I've been at the gym, and I know you can't tell, but I go to the gym a lot. Just imagine with me. Like, use your creative, you know, just. I cannot tell you, I, I, I've literally had people slide, like come in and slide with tears in their eyes, like they're sliding into first base or second base, weeping, asking for prayer. And they always begin with this, I'm so sorry. And I say, never apologize for asking for prayer. And it's almost never a prayer for them, it's a prayer for someone else. And I say, let's pray, right there in the gym. Right there in the gym. I can pray for anyone. The book opens with me in the bread aisle in a grocery store. And you wanna know why I know that? Because I am gluten free. I love bread and bread hates me. The Lord has not answered that prayer. He's the bread of life, that's all I get. You guys enjoy your gluten at lunch. But I was on the bread aisle shopping for my wife and a woman said, are you Matt Brown? I said, yes. She said, are you the pastor of Sentinel's Church? I said, yes. She said, I need a miracle. And I said, what's it for? And with tears in her eyes, she said, it's my marriage. And she began to weep and she made a scene. She said, we have kids, Pastor Matt. We have kids. And we prayed right there for a miracle. We can pray and ask for a miracle for anyone. I wanna ask you this question, whose wedding was it? Do you know we don't know? Like I can't wait to be in heaven and we're like hanging out, chilling, I don't know what we're gonna do in heaven, but there's gonna be some rando couple. Oh yeah, we were the ones. It's like, nice to meet you, apparently you didn't matter. Your names weren't in, your names weren't in the story. But here's the thing, it's not about who needs the miracle, it's about who can give the miracle. The story's about Jesus. He matters. 1 Timothy 2, 1, I urge you, first of all, to pray for who? All people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. Do you know what it means to intercede? It means you take their place. You can pray for a loved one who does not have faith. You can do that. It's you standing before God for someone. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them and pray for them. Jesus says this, but I say love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In that way you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven, for he gives sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. You may have given up on a loved one, but God will never give up on them. You may have a loved one that's battling addiction, that's lost to addiction, that's homeless and on the streets. Man, I have seen God change lives. When people come to church and they give their lives to Christ, it's amazing how rehab works when somebody returns to God. Don't ever give up on somebody. Don't give up on your kid. Don't give up on your family members. Don't give up on your friend. Don't give up on yourself. But pray, pray. Next, I can ask for a miracle no matter the time. No matter the time. Ephesians 3.20, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. It is never too late to ask for a miracle. It is never too late. Anybody ever wonder why the first miracle that Jesus ever does is turning water into wine? Does anybody know what fermentation takes? It takes time. What is Jesus teaching us? He's the Lord even of time. We say this all the time. Father, time is never lost. He did once. He lost to Jesus. 
Jesus beat Father Time. Father Time is not in charge of your time. The Lord Jesus is. And let me say this. We can't go back and change the beginning. Oh, I wish we could. All my kids are adults now. You know what I tell them? Hey, your first 10 counseling sessions are on me. <laughs> They're on me. Dad, Daddy didn't know what he was doing. My first kid is a guinea pig. We were just practicing on her. Like, we didn't know. You know, you get 20 counseling sessions because we had no idea what we were doing. But I mean, has anybody in here ever wished you could go back and do something different? I, I don't know how many times I've said this when Tammy and I, when we get in a fight, now we don't give in a fight because I'm a pastor and I have Jesus in my heart. We, we share differences, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we exchange ideas verbally. But you know what I said multiple times in our marriage? I said, time out, can, can, can we start over? Like, you know what I'm saying, guys, when it's so bad, <laughs> they, there's just no digging yourself out of the hole, it's just gonna get deeper. I just go, time out, can we start over? Look, you can't start over and change your beginning, but you can start over today and change your ending. Amen? And one of my favorite sentences in this book is here's my prayer, whatever you're going through, whatever heartache you face, whatever disease you're battling is not the end of your story, it is simply a chapter in your story. And it's one that you win. And it's one that you come out of. It's one that God uses to transform you and change you. You see, the storm is never where we wanna be, but sometimes it's exactly where God has us. It's exactly where God has us. God is the God even of time. It's never too late to ask for a miracle. There are miracles in this book that if I wasn't there, I, I don't know if I could believe them, but I was there. And the miracle in the last chapter is something that, as I share it with you, I, I still can't even comprehend that it happened. In 2012, Tammy and I, we, went, we joined a medical mission trip. Now, that's interesting because we'd, we'd never been on a mission trip like this in our lives, and we are not medical people. We are not doctors, we are not nurses, we have no medical training. So I didn't understand why this group wanted us to go on this trip but I was the chaplain. I was to provide spiritual care for the doctors and the nurses and the surgeons. And we went on this trip and we had a wonderful time. It was an amazing time. We were in Vietnam for over a month and we literally would go out into the villages and find people with tumors and goiters and cleft palates and broken legs. And we would say, we can take you to a hospital and do surgery for free. We watched parents cry and young people celebrate because we were able to do this through our church. And everything was great and fantastic until right about at the end of the trip. And I got a text message that said, please pray, something's gone terribly wrong at the hospital. And I thought, okay, well, let's pray. I didn't think anything of it. And then about an hour later, it said, things are looking grim. Please pray. And then about an hour later, a text message came in and said, Matt Brown, please come to the hospital at once. I had no idea what was happening. But I got to the hospital and they told me that the problem was in the OR. And they had me scrub in, you know what I'm saying? Like doctors, you know, you see on the, on the TVs, I did the whole elbow thing and I, you know, you walk around like this, you know what I'm saying? Put on the, the surgical outfit, walked through the rooms, into the room, and there I see an absolute pandemonium. People are yelling and screaming and people are pointing fixture, fingers at one another and this giant doctor from Texas massive man, a heart surgeon, screams out loud, and I'm not gonna cuss, but he cussed, and he said, call it, the kid is dead. And then I see the little boy, he's 18 months old, and they had done cleft palate surgery. The surgery went fine, but when he came out of anesthesia, he never came out, and he never breathed on his own, and he had not breathed for eight hours. And Dr. Viendone, who was at the baby's head, looked at me and he said, we're not calling him dead until Pastor Matt prays. I grew up Baptist, people. We pray for you until you're dead and then the Lord has spoken, amen? You know what I'm saying? And he said, Pastor Matt, I want you to pray. And I wish I could tell you I was full of faith, but I was full of fear. I was in a room of medical professionals. Let me tell you something. If you stop breathing today, don't come running up to the altar. Call 911, because here's what I'm gonna do. I hope you know Jesus, you know? <laughs> a 
And they said, will you pray? And I said, yes. And all the doctors, the anesthesiologists, the translators, they started to walk out. And I said, whoa, 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 where's everybody going? I was like, we're all in this together. I said, everybody get in a circle like we're at youth camp. These are doctors and surgeons and anesthesiologists. I said, everybody hold hands. I'm in charge now. The chaplain has spoken. And they got in a circle around this little boy. And I prayed over him. And I got to be honest with you. I can't remember everything I said, but I remember as a confession, being afraid to say amen. And here's what I remember. I said, Lord Jesus, we did this. I need you to fix this. We came here to help, but we hurt this guy. And I prayed over the little guy, and he's lying completely naked on this table. And I said, please, in the name of Jesus, heal him. I'm praying over his middle section, his head's right here, his legs are right here, and his little penis goes, boop. <laughs> and I'm looking at this thing, and, I, and then psh, it just pees, psh, shoot, shoots pee. And I jump back and I'm like, oh my God, what happened? So my first miracle was an erection, not a resurrection, right? So, so I, I'm, I'm not medically trained, okay? I, I don't know that that's the first sign that the brain just kicked on. His brain just kicked on, his penis went up, the urine went out, and then I look, and this little, little Vietnamese boy is looking at this crazy white man looking at him, and he's blinking, and he's crying, and the doctor scoops him up, and they hold him up like in the Lion King. And Dr. Vian Dunn says, it's a miracle, he's alive. And he was well, and whole, and healed. And I still can't believe it. And I backed up and I looked at, I'm not gonna say that, I don't have permission to share the doctor's name. Uh, the, the surgeon, I, he, he's up against the wall. He's weeping. He's not a Christian. He's not a Christian. He's a plastic surgeon. I asked him, what do you do? Ladies, he said, I make mountains out of molehills. That's what he told me he does for a living. <laughs> Breast augmentation, if you didn't get it yet. And I asked him, I said, why do you do that? Here's what he told me. He said, I hated being a surgeon and giving families bad news. So he goes into plastic surgery because he doesn't like death. He goes to Vietnam, he made a mistake, he put the wrong size airway tube in the boy, and when they pulled it out, his airway spasmed and closed. And just so you know, there's nothing they can do when that happens. And he knew he made a mistake, and he knew he killed this kid. He had tears running down his face, he looked at me and he said this, Pastor, it's just like the stories my mom told me. It's just like the miracles in the Bible. Amen. And I just, I just, I, I, what do you do with that? How do you process that? And, and let me tell you something. We all are here today because we believe a guy was dead for three days and he rose. That's why we're here today, amen? I'm not saying this is gonna happen every time you pray, but I'm gonna tell you this. I prayed one time and it happened right in front of me. I saw it and I'll never, ever be the same again. So let me ask you this question. What do you need prayer for today? It's not too late for your marriage. It's not too late. It's not too late for a child. It's not too late for your finances and it's not too late for your health. What does God wanna do in your life today? What does God wanna do? Ecclesiastes 3.11, yet God has made everything beautiful in its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work. For some of us today, this is our faith journey. This is all we got. What if God has something more? What if God wants to do a miracle in your life? What if God wants to transform your marriage? What if God wants to heal your disease? 
What if God wants to move in this church in a way that he's never moved before? What if God wants to change your life? Jesus turned six stone jars into wine. Do you know how much this represents? One of those jars. Just one. He transformed six of these from water into wine. And you say, Pastor Matt, we got no water in our marriage. We didn't have mist. Do you think Jesus needed the water? Do you think Jesus needed the stone jars? What did Mary say? Just do whatever he says. The only thing you need for your miracle is your faith. And say, God, I need you to move. I need you to move in my life. I need you to transform me and I need you to change me. I need you to move. I need you to fill me. I'm gonna invite the pianist to come on out and I'm just gonna ask him to play some, some music over this. But there are some of us in here today, you need a miracle. And I don't know what it's for. Some of you here today, you're like, well, Pastor Matt, can, can these things really be real? I want you to know, every single story that you read in this book, I had to get the people that I used in this book to sign a waiver. These are all real stories. Every story is a real person. Every story is a real miracle. These are all people that I know personally. And I've seen God move in them, and I know he can move in you because he loves you. If you're a person in here and you need prayer for your marriage, pray for your, prayer for your health, for your finances, for a child or for a friend, if you need a miracle in any area of your life, I'm just gonna ask you to stand, that's it. I want you to stand and I'm gonna pray over you. Is there anybody here that needs one? Right there, and they help her up, amen. Anybody else? And again, I'm not promising what God will do, but I know what he can do. And that's where our faith must lie, in what he can do. Remember what the Bible says? With God, all things are possible. So if you just hold out your hands like this and say, God, you know my heart, you know my struggle, you know my issue, please move. Whatever it is that you need right now in the quietness of your own voice, just tell God. Just tell God, cry out to him. Say, Lord, move in my heart. Move in my life. Heavenly Father, I just pray your Holy Spirit would just be in this room right now. Lord, you know every name. You know every person. Lord, you know every hair that is on top of our heads. You know everything about us. You know us better than we know ourselves. Lord Jesus, move in these people's lives, and I pray that you would move miraculous in whatever it is that they have brought to you today. Do miracles, we pray in Christ's name, amen. I love you, Southwest Church. Thank you so much for having me today. God bless.